and gentlemen, joining us from South Africa, here is the Boxing Lockdown. It's showtime. Welcome to another episode of the Boxing Lockdown, powered by SA Boxing Talk. Unfortunately, Hayden had a commitment he couldn't make. We asked Devin to fill in. Fortunately, his IT department failed. Um, I've got Cyril in the Zoom house. And tonight, we're talking about one organization and one person. And I'll give you guys a clue. So I want to welcome the IBF president, Daryl Peoples. Daryl, welcome to the Boxing Lockdown. Thanks, Carl. And uh, before you ask me why isn't this badge on a boxing short, let me just say I like keeping a spare one just in case. And I wear this badge with pride, as you know. Daryl, I want to get right into it. This, this interview is about you, about the IBF, your career in boxing. Where did this all start, this, this crazy sport that we love called boxing? Where did it start for you? Well, I guess it was around 1995. Um, that IBF president, Bob Lee, he brought me on as an administrative assistant. So, like all administrative assistants do, I was taking phone calls, making copies, um, back in 95, sending faxes. Um, so that was my first step into boxing professional. And then, um, talking about the IBA, the IBF is known to enforce um, their mandatories a lot more efficiently, in my opinion anyway, than your other sanctioning bodies. Why do you think that is? Why is it that the IBF makes their champions actually fight the mandatories, whereas the others tend to take a bit more time? And why? Well, you know, Cyril, um, throughout boxing, um, and probably so, the IBF, we're known as rules guys. Um, our rules are pretty specific as far as enforcing mandatories. Um, you notice in some weight divisions, you'll see the number one and number two positions not ranked. And we prefer to fill those positions through the elimination process. I mean, that's not unique to the IBF. but that's one of the things that we like to do. Try and find somebody who, at least according to the ratings, um, should be in a position to fight for an eliminator. So, um, mandatory and elimination process, it, it's spelled out pretty clearly in the rules, and, and we try to follow them to the best of our ability. Now, Daryl, due to the Obviously, the worldwide lockdown, you could say. Um, I was relegated, not relegated, but going through a lot of YouTube fights back in the day. And uh, I came across a fight in 1997, Costa Zoo and uh, Vince Phillips. It was a big upset. And there was a certain person handing over an IBF belt, which happened to be you. And I sent you a screenshot of it. And I want to ask you, and you started in boxing in 95. What was the first bout you supervised with the IBF? And, and who was it? And do you remember it? It was an IBF intercontinental fight. Um, forgive me for not remembering the opponent, but it was McKelly Picarillo. Um, that was the first fight that I supervised as an IBF supervisor. Um, Picarillo won. Um, Remarkably, <laughs> Mark Nelson, who we all know is, I mean, certainly a world caliber referee, um, he refereed that bout. And that was both of our first IBF fights. Um, that, uh, <laughs> there, I, there, I could tell you some stories behind that, just getting there, but. We were so excited, and you know how it is to put your first one in the books. That was really important. A lot of things went wrong. Um, I got through it as the supervisor, and Mark got through it as the referee and the judge. Um, <laughs> so it, it, that was something special that I'll always remember. 
Um, in all these years as a fight supervisor and working in boxing, which fight would you say was your most memorable fight? You know, that, that's a tough one. Um, I've had an opportunity to see some great fights. Um, I'm a boxing fan. If you ask me who's my favorite fighter, you know, I'm going to have some bias and say most of our IBF champions. Um, And again, forgive me for forgetting the opponent. Um, One was when Paul Spadafora won his world title. Um, Pacquiao winning his first IBF title. Um, I could give you several Roy Jones, Mike Tyson, and Felix Trinidad fights. Um, I mean, Joe Frazier. (laughs) I mean, that wasn't really an IBF fight. But, I mean, just certainly epic fights. Um, I just like watching boxing. Daryl, I want to talk about Pacquiao winning his first IBF title. Unfortunately for us, for South Africans, that was against Ladwaba. And I know you have a real strong feel for African boxing. We discussed it, came to you and I over the last couple of years. But, but how do you view South African boxing? I mean, we had a strong history with the IBF, as you know. And obviously now there seems to be a resurgence of South African fighters, obviously with the IBF. But what's, what's your opinion of South African boxing? Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's kind of the joke I shared with you, Kyle. Um, we thought it was a rule that the junior lightweight title uh, champion had to be South African for a while. Um, <laughs> um, and on that note, um, there is amazing talent in South Africa. Um, and, and for years, um, South Africa has been stronghold of African boxing for for the whole continent. Um, There's a lot of guys down there that can fight. Um, Boxing is global and and you have to deal with the challenges from each country um, individually. Some have more advantages than others. But I mean, there's just guys down there that can fight um, and if they had or if they have the opportunity to to get some opportunities that other fighters have I mean there, there's world champions down there um, South Africa's got a, a, a proud tradition I mean you guys have had a lot of world champions down there um, there, there's a lot of talent, and I just hope that these guys guys get some opportunities. Um, you, you talk about um, a lot of talent in South Africa. Do you, um, do you have any favorites, any South African fighter who you think this was a standout guy, past or present? Um. You gotta love Maruti. <laughs> Um, uh, again, I'd have to name most of our recent light heavyweight champions. <laughs> um, I, there's guys I like to watch, uh, again, Maruti, but, you know, I don't have favorites. There's guys I like to watch. Um, and you know, I don't want to sound non-committal, but I mean, I follow, I follow all of our South African champions. Um, so I like all of our guys down there. Daryl, you were talking about Mark Nelson and you traveling. I'm, I believe it was to Italy for the IBF Intercontinental. 
and you said it was a mission getting there and it was your first championship you and Mark. But going back and being supervisor or just watching a fight, what's the funniest moment in your career doing an IBF fight where you thought, I can't keep a straight face. It was just really something really funny happened. Was it a weigh in? Was it the rules meeting? Was the trainers getting stuck in? Was, you know, was it a stare down? What was a funny moment that sticks out for you? You know, that's a, that's a tough one, Kyle. Um, Usually, the funniest things happen after the fight when everyone has their game face off and everybody's just being everyone. Um, one of the funniest experiences I had around the fight, I think, was in the Philippines when we were walking down the street eating Philippine street food. And uh, you know, it's just interaction with a lot of the officials. Um, I don't want to sound like a stick in the mud, but usually around weigh-ins, I mean, I'm congenial, but I'm more of a game-based type of guy. Um, I take it kind of seriously. Um, I, I, I do have a sense of humor, but... Um, I, that that's not the time <laughs> to be jokey i suppose but i mean you know boxing's full of characters there there's a lot of funny things that go on i, I mean i can't pick one thing that stands out more than the other daryl bad decisions are part of the sports um our friendship actually started with me writing a love letter to to you and ibf uh with regards to Hickey Butler, Milan Melindo. Um, we moved past that, and obviously the IBF ruled in Hickey's favor. Um, but has there ever been a situation where you're watching a fight, where you're ringside, and all there was a review, and you thought to yourself, without naming a particular fight, um, I have been ringside supervising. Um, because that's different when I'm going being the president. I'm not scoring the fight. I'm watching other things. But yes, I have had some scorecards that have come in that have looked peculiar. Um, you hate to do it because you don't want to give the appearance of influence in the judge, but yeah, I've seen some scorecards where I've had to get up and walk to the other side of the ring and ask an official if he knew which fighter was which. Um, and again, I'm not a judge, <laughs> um, but after doing it for a few years, you kind of get a knack for who's winning the fight. Um, so, yeah, that was a peculiar moment. Um, but it happened. And let me finish by saying this. In my experience, and there's people who've been doing this, meaning supervising fights, um, a lot longer than I, but I don't think that I've ever come across a judge um, who scored anything other than he's seen. Um, he may see it differently, um, and that's a matter of training and experience, but I, I, I personally haven't come across a judge who's going to score something other than he sees. And then now moving on to the big fights at the, uh, now, uh, at the moment. One of the biggest announcements in recent weeks was 
a possible fight between Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua next year. Now, both guys still have, still have other fights that they need to fight. And I think Anthony Joshua has to still has to defeat the title against Pulev, um, the IBF title against Pulev. Um, but obviously, the IBF rules also state that man, um, unifications take pre precedence over the over um, mandatories. So does this mean that Pulev will have to wait for the winner between Fury and Joshua? No. And, and that's a good question, Cyril, because there's a lot of moving parts to this. Um, as it stands, um, and as far as we know, there's already been a commitment for Joshua to fulfill his mandatory obligation with the IBF, and that's his fight with Pulev. Um, there's also a rematch clause with Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury that's going to be enforced. After that, I believe, or, or what's being contemplated is Dillian White um, asserting his rights as the mandatory. From the IBF perspective, um, there's a, a, a loosely constructed rotation system amongst the sanctioning bodies. Um, and that way, we're, we, we, we really try hard <laughs> not to fragment the title. But again, from the IBF perspective, once Joshua fights Pulev, his mandatory obligation to the IBF is done. Um, but it gets complicated. He, he holds multiple titles. And, as the champion, champion of multiple organizations, you have multiple mandatory obligations. Um, despite the the common perspective, um, we we try to work it out amongst the sanctioning organizations. We we all realize a unified champion is best for boxing. Daryl, I want to talk to you about um, rematch clauses in case a champion makes a defense against a voluntary and loses, and there is a rematch clause. Very rarely does the IBF honor the rematch clauses because that's not within the IBF policy. Can you answer me on that? And I'll give you an example because Jojo Diaz, the Kevin Farmer, apparently there's a rematch clause in the contract. But Rikimov is a mandatory uh, fighter for Jojo Diaz. So although there's a rematch clause, that doesn't really concern the IBF because you want to do what's fair and what's right. Can you just explain to the viewers who are going to be watching this, your stance as the IBF, which is very different to some of the other organizations? Well, Jojo Diaz, when he beat Kevin Farmer, he beat him in an optional defense. Okay. Um, if a champion loses his title in an optional defense, he has six months, not nine months, to defend his title. Um, we did get a request for an optional defense for Jojo Diaz, the fight farmer. Um, there were some issues regarding the timeline. Um, I don't want to get too much further into it because there's always the possibility of litigation. Um, but that that's our position on it. Um, as we always do, you know, the IBF, we, we want the champions to fight their mandatories. Um, there's an optional period for you to fight whoever you want to, and then I mean, I'm not aware of the terms of the rematch agreement, but maybe you can comply then. Um, 
but that's a management thing, Kyle. That's you know our our rules are clear. <laughs> um, one of the things that stands out about the IBF compared to the other bodies is that you don't have too many titles. Like you've got one world title, and only you have an interim title when the situation warrants one. But you never really have a, but which which I believe is a good thing. It becomes easier to understand, whereas other you know other sectioning bodies will have multiple champions who are all world champions. Is this a policy of yours not to create any other belts or any other world titles, or is this just how it came to be? Well, again, Cyril, I'm gonna go back to our rules. I mean, they're again they're pretty clear one champion in each weight class. Um, there is sometimes the utility to have an interim champion. Um, in the case of the IBF, that's if the world champion has an injury and there's a process for medical exceptions that we have to go through. Um, but unless the world champion can't defend his title, typically for medical reasons, will allow an interim champion. And more or less that's to keep activity going because again, as I mentioned earlier, we have an elimination process and you might have someone who fought in an eliminator to get the opportunity to fight the champion, but if the champion is disabled, we'll let him fight the interim champion. Um, and then with us, the interim champion, that's the mandatory contender for the world champion who's disabled or unavailable to defend his title. Daryl, a, a common criticism of boxing is, is that there's so many sanctioning bodies. And obviously, I'm not putting you on the spot, but obviously, it's a question you get and I get all the time as boxing people. What do you say to that? What do you say to that? Because people say, oh, well, there's only one World Cup soccer. There's only one World Cup rugby. You know, there's so many champions in boxing. Why is that? What do, what do you say to those people? You know, there, there has been a proliferation of sanctioning bodies. Um, There's only a few boxers out there that can be in the position they're in without the title of world champion. There's a few. Most of them cannot. Um, there's four recognized major organizations, the WBA, the WBC, and the WBO outside of us. Um, but there's also the IBO, which, listen, you, they deserve mention. Um, Ed Levine is a good guy. He, he's completely transparent about how he's different from us. Um, and he offers another opportunity um, for, for fighters. Um, as far as four organizations, I, I look at this, Kyle, there's a few more opportunities. Um, we have to take responsibility to make sure that people are worthy <laughs> of being called a world champion. But um, look, the, the four titles gives opportunities to a lot of guys that, I mean, to some degree, boxing is regional. You know guys in South Africa. I know guys in the States. Um, my representative, Roberto Rea, knows guys in Europe. Um, so 
people who might not be mainstream, you, you have the we organizations that are looking at people all over the world. So, I mean, you got to have four to give some guys opportunities. Um, but it, it, I think four major organizations that are recognized <clears throat> is not too much um, based on the opportunities we give some of these guys. Um, in terms of unifications, how much work and how difficult or how easy is it to work with the other sanctioning bodies? In general? Um, Generally. In, in, in general, we have a lot of unwritten rules. Um, but not to say that that's just the wild. Um, again, we have pretty strict rules on mandatories. And again, I've also acknowledged that a unified champion is best for boxing. Um, <clears throat> so we, we work well together. Um, there's not animosity as a lot of people would like to think. Um, but again, we all have rules. Some of them address different things. Um, but a lot of unifications, um, there's some things that people don't consider. Television contracts, sponsorships with other people, um, or sponsorships in general. Um, I mean, they have a lot of influence outside of what we decide as sanctioning organizations. But I, I feel comfortable in saying that all of us pretty much are for unifications and that's why we have built in our rules that the unification has precedence over a mandatory. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to ask you is that a lot of people don't actually realize that a unification will supersede a mandatory position. And that's because you want to see legitimately potentially one world champion in the division. Um, I want to go a little bit deeper. If boxing wasn't part of Daryl people's life, what would you be, or what would you be doing and why? <laughs> um, that's a tough one, Kyle, because for close to half of my life, <laughs> this is what I've been doing. Um, because I enjoy my daughters, one of them who was young. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, I would probably think about at least as a substitute teaching little kids. Um, like grade schoolers, elementary school. Because um, especially now with the craziness going on, <laughs> I mean, you could go to school and laugh every day or go to work and laugh every day. Because little kids are fun. Um, before you got into boxing, you were a fan before you started working in boxing. Who would you say was your favorite fighter before you were started working in the sport? <clears throat> um, hands down, without a doubt, And for no reason in particular, I was a Joe Frazier fan. Um, I also like George Foreman. Um, yeah, those were, you know, 
of course, Muhammad Ali, larger than life. But yeah, I like Joe Frazier and George Foreman, just for no reason in particular. Daryl, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on the Boxing Lockdown. Your last parting shot for any South African fans that are going to be tuning in and watching this. Um, as we started off, call, um, look, hmm. there's amazing talent in South Africa. Um, there's amazing talent all over Africa. And, and you know that as you've traveled and you're trying to bring some guys into the fold. Um, look, Boxing's on a lull. We're going to rebound. Um, South Africa, you concentrate on the things that made you guys great and, and get back to that. And uh, I hope to bring some more red belts down there. Uh, well, I definitely I want to play my part in doing that as well. That's the IBF president, Daryl Peoples, joining us from America, right here on the Boxing Lockdown. We'll catch you again soon. Yeah.